Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Michael Kraus, and I teach political science here. Uh, it is my uh, great pleasure uh, this afternoon to welcome uh, Vladimir Popov, uh, I should say, to welcome Volodya Popov back in Middlebury. Um, he uh, is an old friend of Middlebury, as it were, or a young friend, um, having uh, come here back in, uh, for the first time in 1987 when uh, he was still then a graduate student at the uh, Institute of the United States and Canada uh, in Moscow, uh, which was part of the uh, Soviet uh, Academy of Sciences. And uh, this was one of the first ventures, joint ventures, you might say, between uh, Soviet uh, academics and American academics. And we are privileged here in Middlebury to be part of it, um, a conference that was held in Breadloaf and that subsequently uh, produced uh, additional uh, conferences and some volumes uh, that came out, publications, a series of exchanges, and so on. Uh, so it's very gratifying to have uh, Volodya back. Now, it is uh, 2006, and so what has Volodya been up to since uh, 1980? Well, a great deal, um, to say the least. Uh, today, he is uh, the head of uh, a section at the Academy of the National Economy in Moscow. Um, he is uh, also a professor at the New Economic School in Moscow, which is really the number one institution if you want to study economics in Russia. Um, and he's also a visiting professor um, at, uh, the, uh, uh, at the Carleton University in Ottawa. He's held a series of uh, distinguished appointments uh, in the intervening years, including uh, between 1996 and 98 as a senior research fellow at the World Institute for Development Economics Research at the, of the United Nations University in uh, Helsinki, Finland. Um, he has um, authored, uh, uh, co-authored, co-edited uh, uh, half a dozen uh, books, uh, some of which uh, uh, including um, uh, one entitled uh, Transition and Institution, The Experience of Late Reformers, uh, was published by Oxford University Press in 2001. The Turning Point, um, co-authored with another distinguished Russian economist, Nikolai Shmelyov, appeared in 1989, and so on. His uh, most recent adventure has uh, taken him to China, and uh, he published uh, in uh, 2002 a book called Tri Kapielki Vadi, Zamietki Nekitaista Akitaya. Uh, three drops of water, observations of a non-China specialist about China. Non-sinologist. Uh, Non-sinologist. Um, so uh, obviously his research interests uh, range widely. Uh, and uh, uh, today he is going to uh, give a presentation um, entitled Democracy and Growth Reconsidered. Why economic performance of new democracies is not encouraging. His uh, talk is uh, co-sponsored by the Christian Johnson Economics Enrichment Fund, the Rohayton Center uh, for International Affairs, uh, International Studies, International Politics and Economics. Um, I am delighted to welcome Volodya back. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, and uh, it's really nice to be back to Middlebury. Uh, as you grow older, you sort of develop this understanding that you don't have much time to develop the new contacts. So you start to cherish the old contacts even more. So it's nice to be back to Middlebury. Thank you, Michael, for making an effort to bring me here. And thank you, everyone, who uh, decided to come here today and to lend me your ears for another half an hour and also for the question period. In exchange, I promise I'll try to be as provocative as possible uh, so as to give you uh, some kind of uh, uh, you know, ideas, uh, probably non-conventional ideas, about the topic which is uh, today uh, uh, on the screen. Uh, so basically, uh, the uh, literature on the issue is extensive. Yes, it's very, there is a vast literature, 
And uh, it is appropriate to start by saying that there are two philosophical traditions. One is the Western tradition, the other is the Oriental tradition. The Western tradition associated with the name of John Rawls basically says that uh, human rights and especially political rights are not subject to political bargaining or to the calculus of social interests. So basically you cannot negotiate uh, human rights. Uh, they belong to the people uh, uh, by uh, the will of the God or by uh, nature, by natural reasons. Uh, the other tradition, however, is the Asian tradition, which is usually called Asian values and uh, associated with the name of the Chinese philosopher Confucius. Uh, and this is the tradition that basically says that the interests of the community are superior to the interests of individual and the interests of individual may be sacrificed for the greater good of the community, including uh, uh, the interests which are associated with human rights, including the interests which are associated with political rights. So uh, Lee Kuan Yew, the uh, former president of Singapore, uh, made an argument that for the benefit of economic growth and uh, general law and order, it's necessary to maybe limit sometimes the human rights, and this is a reasonable approach. I'm not the one who is going to resolve the uh, uh, debate uh, between these two schools of thought. The uh, topic of uh, today's paper which is being presented is much more modest one. The topic is whether uh, the uh, developmental goals are always consistent between themselves. In particular I look at the developmental goals like the GDP per capita. Every country wants to have higher GDP per capita but there are also other priorities like uh, for instance life expectancy, like education, like clean air and environment in general like law and order, equitable income distribution, and also democracy. Democracy is one of the rights, one of the goals of the development, one of the uh, human rights. Uh, it is the goal in itself. Uh, and the question is whether this goal, the achievement, the attainment of this goal, sometimes contradicts the achievement of the other goals. Uh, now, there is a huge literature on the issue. Is there a trade-off between uh, democracy and growth? How democracy influences growth? The key name here is Adam Brzevorski, who did quite a number of studies on the issue, uh, finding little evidence that democracy has an impact on economic growth, but finding a lot of evidence that democratic countries uh, and authoritarian countries are different in a number of other respects. For instance, the share of investment in GDP, the volatility of growth rates is different, uh, the birth rates and death rates are very different in democracies and in autocracies once you control for other variables. Uh, uh, if we summarize, try to summarize the literature, basically there are studies that show that uh, there is positive influence, negative influence, and no influence at all. So you got the whole spectrum of the studies. I'll point out to one of the recent studies, which was Human Development Report, uh, published in 2002, which was uh, uh, devoted to that particular topic. And uh, basically it argues that there is no trade-off between democracy and growth. So once you achieve, once you democratize, yes, it is not detrimental for growth. So if it doesn't help you to grow, at least it helps you to achieve other developmental goals, which is democracy itself. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, other uh, big name in economics is Robert Barrow, who actually pointed out to the fact that it's not democracy, but it's basically the rule of law that influences growth most. For a country that starts with weak institutions, weak democracy and little rule of law, an increase in democracy is less important than an expansion of the rule of law as a stimulus for economic growth and investment. And this is where I start. Uh, uh, this is the value added of our paper. Uh, this is the paper co-authored by your obedient servant and Viktor Polterovich. Uh, I forgot to mention it in the beginning. And basically our idea is as follows. We distinguish between the rule of law and democracy, or as we say, law and order is a better term, and democracy. Uh, and uh, the second contribution to the literature is that we look not only at the level of democracy, which is measured by political rights index, uh, which is currently computed by Freedom House, uh, and we look also at the change in this index, so at the increment in uh, democracy, at the democratization, how we call it. So the idea is as follows. Uh, say, look at Europe in the 19th century. In the 19th century, European countries were liberal, 
but uh, not very democratic. This is what we mean when we say liberal democracies. Liberal is no less important than democracy. The adjective liberal is no less important than democracy. Think about the code of Napoleon. You can guarantee a lot of rights with the code of Napoleon, property rights and contract rights, which are so important for economists, but also the other rights, the right to be free from religious discrimination, gender discrimination, ethnic discrimination. Uh, the best way to think about it is to look at Hong Kong before the handover to China in 1997 and after handover to China in 1997. There was no democracy in Hong Kong when the British ruled Hong Kong. There was even no city council. Now there is more democracy. There is a city council. Yes, the communists established the city council and half of the members are elected in competitive elections in Hong Kong, but the other half is appointed by the Chinese communist government in Beijing. Uh, but basically, you know, they say there is, uh, there is not a full-fledged democracy in Hong Kong. However, if you ask a question, if, if, if there is a rule of law in Hong Kong, well, yes, this is one of the countries that guarantees the basic rights, right, better than all the other countries. So the definition would be as follows. Uh, the rule of law or law and order is about all human rights, excluding very small portion of total rights, which are called political rights. Political rights is the right to vote, to organize in political parties, the rights to free press, for free meetings, and so on. If you think about it, even the right for free press can be delivered by authoritarian regime, and there are good examples. Say in Hong Kong, the press was always uh, uh, pretty free, under the British today as well. So there are examples when the rights for free press are being delivered by authoritarian regime. So Europe in the 19th century first became liberal in the sense that there was a rule of law, right? The, the right for the fair trial in the court, the right to be free from all kinds of discriminations, the right uh, to have law and order in general and to have contract rights and property rights. It was getting more and more liberal and gradually getting democratic. Uh, if you look at Europe, for, for instance, at Louis Philippe uh, uh, time in France, uh, the percentage of population that voted was something like 5% only. Uh, because women did not vote, because uh, uh, there were different restrictions like restrictions on uh, uh, the uh, uh, wealth uh, that you have, restrictions on the permanent residence, restrictions sometimes on the level of education, many other restrictions. So basically countries became democratic just recently. First European countries were becoming liberal, then democratic. In East Asia we have this story unfolding uh, very recently. Uh, uh, basically in 1980s, Korea and Taiwan became democratic countries just in late 1980s. Were they liberal before that? Yes, they were liberal and liberalizing, getting more and more liberal. Basic rights were insured and afterwards they became democratic. So the argument is that once countries move from liberalism to democracy, from the rule of law to democracy, they make a transition to democracy when basic rights are insured, except for a very small group of rights, voting rights, elections, right? Then the results in terms of economic performance, in terms of life expectancy, in terms of income inequalities, crime rates, many indicators. Then these results are pretty good. If countries choose another road, or by you know, historical coincidence of events, they are taking the other road, moving from democracy to liberalism, then something emerges which is called illiberal democracies. Uh, uh, this weak illiberal democracies uh, are uh, emerged in uh, initially Latin America, right, which democratized before the rule of law was established, in South Asia as a region in sub-Saharan Africa, and in the region with which I'm more familiar, uh, something we have in brackets is the uh, uh, post-communist economies. So in every place we have in brackets this post-communist economies. So in former Soviet Union there were definitely illiberal democracies, a lot of democracies sometimes, uh, sometimes less, uh, democracy, but uh, no uh, rule of law. Uh, now, uh, this kind of combination is just about the worst for economic growth, and this is what we're trying to explore. Is there an empirical evidence that this kind of combination is pretty bad for economic growth? So the growth rates for uh, some of the regions of the world are listed here, and as you can see, basically the hypothesis cannot be rejected from the outset. If you look at the change in democracy index as computed from the Freedom House Political Rights Index, uh, then 
uh, you would see that there is a different relationship between economic performance, this is GDP per capita increase, annual average increase in GDP per capita for 25 years, 75, 99. And uh, this increase in democracy index, democracy is measured on a scale from one to seven, uh, so seven is complete authoritarianism, one is United States and most Western countries. So we look at the increases uh, by how many points the index increased. So it looks like in developed countries, this is developed countries, this red or uh, sort of pink dots. Uh, in developed countries, it may be, in both cases, the relationship is very weak. But it's, it looks like there may be a possibility that for developed and developing countries, the relationship is really different. Now, if we have a look at the life expectancy, for instance, changes in democracy index and changes in life expectancy. Here, there is also some weak evidence that uh, there may be a different relationship for poor economies, for rich economies, and for transition economies, which are uh, here uh, uh, selected as a, a special group, subgroup of the poor economies. So, this is the uh, overall statistics. Uh, the new democracies, all the countries of the world, uh, all the new democracies, 62 countries, overall there are more than 200 countries. So in 62 countries, uh, we, have, we call them new democracies, and they're called new democracies if the average index of political rights from 1972-75 to 1999-2002, so in 30 years, increased by 1.5 1 1 points or more, right? Then it's a country that was democratizing, yes? This is what we call new democracies. Uh, so these new democracies, uh, we have them in post-communist world, 20 countries, and another 42 countries in developing world. And all the other countries, except for new democracies, 148 countries. So overall, it's 210 countries. And we can look, for instance, at the annual average growth rates of GDP per capita. For the all new democracies, it's 0.8%. For countries that are not new democracies, 1.4%. We can look at the index of government effectiveness, minus sign, it's the index which ranges from minus one, minus 2.5 to plus 2.5. Minus, minus sign indicates poor effectiveness. So here we have some kind of positive, yes, number. Here we have a negative number. We could look at the shadow economy, the estimates for the shadow economy. Uh, there are two different estimates, 35, 33% in these countries, 20 to 23%, right? So shadow economy is greater. We can look at the increase in the uh, government revenues as a percentage of GDP. Uh, and uh, here, the increases in all the countries are considerable. Generally, it happens with the uh, increase in GDP per capita. But in uh, new democracies, it's less spectacular. And in uh, new democracies in post-communist countries, uh, there was a decrease in the share of government spending in GDP. Uh, government budget deficit, right? Here, it's minus 4.5%. For the other countries, it's something like 4%. Uh, this is unconditional inflation, the same thing, right? Uh, only with life expectancy we get somewhat controversial results. Uh, looking for life expectancy here, and this is life expectancy. We get 5.7 years here, uh, and we get 7 years for all the countries, but this result is because of the basically reduction of life expectancy in post-communist countries. So if we take new democracies in developing countries, then the increases in life expectancy would be comparable, even larger, than the increases in non-democratic countries, right? Uh, however, if you, you, if you do the multiple regressions, uh, then uh, the result is reversed. So uh, uh, here are some stylized facts from the uh, post-communist countries, the region that I know better. The performance of uh, several countries was better uh, than uh, the performance of the other countries in terms of output as compared to pre-recession level of output, 1989. Uh, was better up to the point that they exceeded already the level of output that existed before 1989. Now, out of these countries, there are some Central European countries, but out of these countries, uh, which are in the former Soviet Union, we have five countries that exceeded already the level of output. Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Estonia. Estonia fits into the pattern. Estonia is democratic. All the other countries are not very democratic. So out of five countries that exceeded the level of output, four are not very democratic. Uh, this is the trajectories of output in former uh, uh, Soviet Union countries. Well, once again, you see that, uh, you know, say, Belarus, this is the line for Belarus, green and red, right, is doing much better than Russia. Russia is more democratic than Belarus, right? And uh, uh, Belarus is called last dictatorship in Europe, uh, 
uh, I wouldn't say this is the case, but uh, it's famous for not being uh, very democratic. Uh, Belarus doesn't have oil, so Belarus was supposed to perform worse than Russia, but somehow Belarus is performing uh, better than Russia. And if we look at the social consequences of uh, transition in uh, these post-communist countries, virtually in all the countries there was a tremendous increase in mortality, right? in crime rate, in murder rate, in suicide rate. Uh, this is a separate topic in itself. Uh, but if uh, uh, we look at Russia, for instance, the country that I know better, uh, uh, I just used this uh, slide in the class today when I was giving this presentation in Michael's class. See, this is mortality today, 16 per million, right? How far back in history we need to go to find this mortality? Even in Stalin times, in 1950, yes, when the labor camps were around, we don't find that high mortality in Russia, right? Uh, today, mortality is nearly two times higher than in 1953 when uh, the Stalin camps were still in place. So the deterioration of social indicators was unprecedented, right? Five years decline in life expectancy that occurred in 1990s. Uh, we don't have precedents when without the war, without the eruption of volcanoes or without any other extraordinary events, just because of the transition or policies, life expectancy declined so much. So uh, basically in the post-communist world, uh, the story of uh, countries that liberalized and democratized uh, is not very uh, you know, impressive. Uh, in terms of human development index, which includes uh, three indicators, GDP per capita, educational levels, and uh, also life expectancy, uh, Russia is uh, still catching up with a level that existed in 1990, right? Russia is still below this level. And, uh, of course, Cuba with a life expectancy of 77 years, even though GDP in Cuba is lower uh, than in Russia, considerably lower than in Russia, but life expectancy is so much greater, 65 years in Russia and 77 years in Cuba. And uh, these are the data for 2003, the last year which is currently available, but if you extrapolate the trends to 2005, China is already uh, outperforming uh, all the uh, former uh, 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 countries uh, of the former Soviet Union. So basically, in this transition world, we have uh, this uh, classification of countries by the rule of law index and the political rights or democracy index, right? We have four groups of countries. One is the group of democratic countries, mostly Central European countries, uh, plus Bulgaria and Baltic states. Uh, so these countries are doing sort of fine, democratic countries and also with a high rule of law. Then we have countries which are authoritarian countries, uh, but they have high rule of law. Uh, China previously did not have high rule of law. Now is the average number for 1990-98, and this is the average number for 1980-89. So China made a tremendous progress in terms of the rule of law. These are the rule of law indices uh, for uh, China. Uh, so you have uh, countries with a rule of law and with little democracy. Democracy here is zero, right? Uh, so uh, these countries are doing very well economically. If you look at countries where the rule of law is sort of low, but they are authoritarian countries, Central Asia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, China in 1980s, uh, they are doing sort of better than the others economically. The worst performance is of course exhibited by something which is called illiberal democracies. Illiberal democracies, high democratization, low rule of law. Well, so much for the story. and. Uh, uh, we try to run regressions for all the countries to find out what is uh, the uh, theory which is supported by the evidence and which is not supported by the evidence. We have some explanations why uh, the democratization may affect negatively economic performance, but first let's look at the evidence. The best equation you get is the following. The growth rates, right, for the recent 25 years, recent means 75 to 2000, are equal to a number of control variables plus Coefficient multiplied by this delta, which is democratization, increase in political rights index, right? And then we have the brackets, rule of law index minus constant. So there is a threshold. The threshold is such that if the rule of law, rule of law is high enough, then democratization is good for you, is good for your growth rates. When democratization is, uh, excuse me, when rule of law is low below 0 0.72, right? then democratization basically affects your growth rates negatively, right? The critical value of, of rule of law index is the one that is observed in countries which are listed here, which are basically countries in the middle, right? 
uh, in, the, in the middle of the total list of countries with the particular rule of law. So to put it differently, countries that managed to reach a certain level of the rule of law benefited from democratization. The other countries did not. Now, there is a problem with uh, these regressions. The regression is pretty robust. We include different uh, indicators such as, uh, for instance, uh, um, usual indicators when you do the growth regressions, you control for the share of investment in GDP because investment, of course, influence uh, growth rates. You control for the population growth rates, which are tied with the growth rates negatively because if your population grows very fast, you need to spend your investment on creating new jobs, right? And that's why China is having the one-child policy uh, so as to limit the growth of population. So then your investment goes to increase the capital labor ratio, which contributes to greater productivity. However, the problem with this regression may be that the uh, rule of law index which we use is the one for 2000. We don't have the indices, rule of law indices for the beginning of the period, right? So there may be something which we call in the geneity problem, right? Because the rule of law index is actually the result of the growth which occurred in recent years. So we need the rule of law indices or the indices of the strength of the institutions for the beginning of the period. We have these indices which are called corruption perception indices. Corruption perception index, this is CPI, right? is calculated by Transparency International. Actually, it's the index of cleanness rather than corruption because it ranges from 0 to 10. So you have 10 or about 10 at Scandinavian countries, uh, close to that in the United States, uh, but low indicators for developing countries. Now, this index is available, at least the estimates are available, for 1980-85. Uh, for 54 countries, 1980-85, uh, and it makes sense because the Soviet Union was in the middle of the list of, of these 54 countries. Uh, uh, developed countries were above the Soviet Union, and developing countries were below, so more corrupted than the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was together with countries like Greece, Portugal, Korea, Spain, Italy, uh, so somewhere at the end of the list of developed countries and in the beginning of the list of developing countries. Now, they, now Russia and former communist countries of the former Soviet Union, they are at the very bottom of the list. So corruption definitely increased. So we use the corruption perception index. We get pretty much the same results and uh, pretty robust results. Uh, and the results are here in this table. Once again, we check it for robustness, including and excluding all the indicators. Uh, however, uh, there may be a problem, uh, you know, once you give this paper uh, to economists, they, they always say that uh, there may be a problem with indigeneity. Uh, it may be that uh, this corruption perception index is not completely exogenous because we take it for the period of 1980-85 and we consider growth from the period of 1975 to 1999. So we use basically instrumental variables to instrument two indicators. One is democratization and the other is the multiple of democratization uh, by this corruption index. Why? Because corruption may be endogenous and also democratization may be endogenous. Endogenous means that not only democratization affects economic growth, but also it may be that economic growth affects democratization. Once you have economic growth, why not to democratize, right? People already got everything, so you know, people are happy, so uh, the ruler just gives another uh, rights to the people, so democratizes uh, the uh, country. So we check for those possibility, and we instrument this variable with uh, uh, the several variables. One is the level of democracy, right? It's negatively related to uh, the uh, democratization, uh, because once you achieve high level of democracy, there is no way to go, right? You're, you're already at the top. Right? So your democratization, the increment, the increase in democracy would be pretty low. Islam dummy variable, which is uh, the, uh, 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 the countries which are members of uh, Organization of Islamic Conference, plays a role. And uh, also uh, net fuel inputs, which is for the preceding period, which is uh, uh, basically the resource curse. Yes, once you, once you have a lot of resources, you're exporter, exporter of oil and other resources, then the syndex enters uh, with a positive sign, so which means that uh, you don't democratize. Once you're the oil exporter, then you don't uh, democratize. So uh, we instrument and we once again get pretty robust results. Uh, and uh, the results are that there is a threshold. If you look at this second equation, uh, corruption perception index has a threshold. Once it is higher than 5.51, which is in the middle of the list, right? 
then democratization has a positive impact on growth. Once it is lower, then democratization has a negative impact on growth. It works with population growth rates, with the share of investment in GDP, and without them, right? So once you control for different variables, uh, you basically get this uh, kind of results. Uh, so these are the table that gives you all these results of regressions, which I uh, uh, will uh, skip. Uh, uh, and I will be prepared to answer uh, the technical questions, but basically to bring the story uh, to the close, uh, we also look at the other measures of institutional capacity of the law and order, right? We define law and order as the ability of the state to enforce rules and regulations based on law. There is a slight nuance here. There may be lawless order and order based on law, right? Lawless order would be in a country, for instance, Stalin's regime, right? Uh, were there a lot of laws? Well, no. Actually, uh, the scholars say that in the beginning of the 50s, there was an increase in the cases which went to the courts instead of going to the party committees, right? Previously, it was party committees that were dealing with, you know, if your husband was drinking, you go to the party committee. You, if your husband would, would be beating you, for instance, right? You wouldn't go to the court. You will ask the party official to deal with it, right? So uh, it was liberalizing. In that sense, the country was liberalizing, but was not completely liberal. So once you have order based on law, and like Hong Kong today, and you make a transition to democracy, uh, this is a pretty unambiguous question. The results are good. But once you don't have the order based on law, and you make a transition to democracy, you get basically Haiti, right? You get the country, this is the first democracy in Latin America. Now it became a democracy in the beginning of the 19th century. Since that time, uh, Napoleon sent the troops to fight uh, the, uh, this was the rebellion of black slaves, basically, that became, that, uh, that uh, got rid of French colonialism, established the uh, democratic regime, uh, and somehow they defeated even Napoleon troops. And since that time, Haiti was democratic. The result is that there was 30 coup d'etats for 200 years, right? Every time, the same story. Every time the democratically elected government and democratically elected government was abusing, misusing power, ended up with the kind of events that just occurred, uh, you know, less than a year ago in Haiti, basically complete disorder, uh, the collapse, uh, chaos of the country and collapse of the uh, institutions. Now then, we look at the different measures of uh, uh, this institutional capacity, like Investment Climate Index, which is available for 1984-1990, uh, so pretty close to the Corruption Perception Index. Uh, here we get uh, the results, which are uh, uh, basically persuasive, uh, but if we control for the population growth and investment, then uh, uh, the regression falls apart. And uh, then we test, basically the rest of the paper is to test the channels, through which channels uh, the democracy may affect negatively economic growth. Democratization may affect negatively economic growth. This is the small scheme of the world, how the world works. So imagine you have illiberal democracy. Illiberal democracy means you have poor rule of law and a lot of democracy, democratization. You introduced voting and free press and political parties and everything. So you have poor protection of civil rights and contract rights and property rights. Usually it goes together, not necessarily, but it goes together with high income inequalities, differences in efficiencies between sectors, resource sector efficient and uh, uh, the manufacturing sector is inefficient, for instance. Uh, very often it goes with resource abundance, once again, not necessarily. But the result of this inefficient, you know, the result of this illiberal democracy is there are several things that undermine growth. First, decline in government effectiveness. And then we document, we look at the indices of government effectiveness and we document that democratization, if it carried out, if it is carried out under the poor rule of law, undermines the effectiveness of the government. Currently, there are indices of the government effectiveness, but also we look at the shadow economy, the objective indicator of the government effectiveness, right? And with the shadow economy, we get very robust results, I'll show you in a moment. Then, uh, there is also uh, the poor tax compliance, and the size of the government basically stops growing. Usually the size of the government with the progress of economic development increases, increases, and increases as a proportion of GDP, right? Here, the growth rates of the government are smaller, right? So the share of the government expenditure in GDP uh, does not increase that fast. And that means that the government is not providing a lot of public goods. The provision of public goods is equal to the amount of the money that government spends multiplied by the efficiency of the operations of the government, right? So the effectiveness of the government goes down and the amount of money spent on public goods goes down. So this is the collapse of the state. In addition, the state is getting privatized, right? The state is getting privatized, the corruption is very high. So uh, basically we have this decline in government effectiveness and the decline of the government itself. 
So uh, the government fails to provide the public goods, and this affects economic growth, of course, negatively, and this also leads to high income inequalities, high crime rates, and low life expectancy. And also the other channel is through poor macroeconomic policy. Macroeconomic policy, industrial policy is a special issue, I'll skip it, but macroeconomic policy in terms of government budget deficit, inflation, debt accumulation, there are poorer indicators. For new democracies, there are poorer indicators. Once you control for other variables, for the level of development, for this and that, uh, actually these uh, countries proceed with poorer macroeconomic policies. So let me just uh, uh, show you, uh, I'll be prepared to answer questions about the data. Uh, I'm, I'm supposed to round up, right? So uh, these this indicators are pretty much, uh, pretty much correlated. Yes, once we look at the index of government effectiveness, it is correlated with the share of the shadow economy. Uh, we basically like the subjective indicators, the share of the shadow economy, uh, more than these subjective indicators because the subjective indicators are first only for uh, the period of 2000. We don't have the indicators for the earlier period, right? And second, they are subjective, right? And uh, uh, they are, uh, uh, you know, they are very much uh, correlated. There are several indices of accountability, of corruption, of government effectiveness, of rule of law, of uh, uh, you know, political stability. Uh, so those indices basically are very correlated. And with the shadow economy, we get also very good results, uh, just uh, 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 to uh, mention a few things. And let me just come to the conclusions. This is, by the way, the size of the government. So uh, see, in, uh, if you look at the size of the government, this is GDP per capita as a percentage of US level. And this is the share of the government revenues uh, why we take revenues? Because uh, expenditure associated with government budget deficit. So we want to net this out. So we take the revenues as a share of GDP and how the share increased from 1971-75 to 1995-99, right? So basically in all the countries, the share was growing. This is the line for 71-75 uh, uh, and this is the line for 95-99. Uh, uh, so, you know, one line is higher than the other, so in the course of time the government increased, uh, but uh, in countries that democratized under, under the poor rule of law, the increase was not that uh, spectacular. And uh, this is the macroeconomic policy story. Uh, so basically, uh, this is the ratio of investment climate to increase in democracy index, to democratization. So inflation very much depends on both, right? Uh, this relationship holds for both indicators. If we go to regressions, we can see that increase in democracy index, uh, positive values means democratization, is positively linked to inflation. We are explaining inflation here. And the level of democracy, lower values mean more democracy, is negatively associated with inflation, even when you control for uh, the rule of law. Of course, well, this is the indicator for the rule of law. This is the International Country Risk Guide, Investment Climate Index. Uh, for this period. So here it's of course negatively related to inflation. Even if after you control for that, you have a negative impact of uh, democracy. So basically to conclude the story, uh, the uh, conclusions are here. And the story is that it seems like there are powerful mechanisms that undermine uh, the economic growth and also social indicators when you democratize uh, under the low rule of law, right? If your law and order is poor, then you have a problem you can run uh, into, you have to pay something for democratization. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't carry out democratization, but you should be aware of the fact that democratization may be in conflict with other developmental goals. So this would be the argument for slow democratization in poor countries, uh, just to avoid increases in mortality, to avoid slower economic growth, uh, and basically, this would be the argument for China, right? Immediate democratization in China may produce undesirable results. Maybe I stop here, right, since I, I think I exhausted my time, and maybe I take the questions. Right? Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Whatever you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, perhaps to, to lead the way, uh, I think in your, in your paper, uh, you uh, suggest
suggest that there are trade-offs, that there may be a trade-off uh, between various developmental goals, and that uh, uh, you conclude that for countries with low, what you call low, low and uh, order, order of data, uh, it may be unwise to democratize precipitously because you'll pay a price for it in terms of growth. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. uh, so what would follow from this for a kind of a practical policy advice mm -hmm. from the standpoint of uh, uh, overcoming an authoritarian uh, type of rule? Uh, what sort of sequence of policies uh, does follow from your theoretical uh, uh, findings? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, see, uh, before we resolve the uh, issue with which I started, you cannot give policy prescriptions. And it may be for different countries, policy prescriptions are different, right? If we take the view that uh, life expectancy is very important, that we don't want to sacrifice uh, human lives for the sake of democracy, right? then the answer is obvious, right? You are not supposed to proceed with rapid democratization. You don't democratize before you create a firm rule of law. If we take the view that democracy is, you know, very important human right and uh, you don't deserve to live in this world if you are not democratic, right? Then the answer that democracy, it's a matter, it's, it's a question what kind of weight you put on democratic goals, on the goal which is called democracy, right? And there are different, uh, you know, there, there are different stories about it, and uh, I can tell a couple, and since uh, Sergei Davidov is here, I can give the example from the uh, Pushkin's novel, The Captain's Daughter, where Grinov is talking to the head of the rebellion, Peasant's Rebellion, whose name is Pugachev. Uh, he's talking, this rebellion took place in 1773, at the time of the American Revolution, basically, 1775. And, uh, uh, he tells, this is the officer of the Tsarist army, who is captured by, by the head of the Peasants' Rebellion, and he says, well, you're a smart guy, you understand that you cannot uh, you know, win the battle against the government troops, so you're doomed, basically. And he tells him a story about the eagle, well, basically the story about the eagle ends up with the morale that it's better to eat the raw meat once than to feed yourself on dead bodies for all your life, right? The, uh, the slogan of the Spartacus uprising, yes, in Rome, in ancient Rome, was it's better to die free than to live in irons, right? In the United States, they say, live free or die, which is in the neighboring state of New Hampshire, yes, uh, which comes from John Stark, right? John Stark is one of the, you know, heroes of American Revolution, right? They also say, remember the Alamo, they say, patria o muerta, the Sandinista slogan, right? I can continue. Actually, Goethe, uh, um, Wolf, Jürgen Wolfgang Goethe, the German poet and, uh, uh, um, uh, and uh, also uh, a statesman, right? He was a statesman, actually. Uh, he said that uh, only uh, those people deserve freedom and life who are fighting for freedom and life uh, every day, right? And uh, if you read it literally, it means other people don't deserve, you know, freedom and uh, uh, and life, so uh, all uh, inhabitants of authoritarian countries are supposed to commit collective suicide just not to waste, uh, uh, waste you know, food uh, for, uh, for nothing, right? Uh, now, the same Goethe, however, said uh, that disorder is worse than injustice, right? And if you think about it, yes, the number of human lives that is worse, that, that, is, that is being lost because of this disorder, if there is, yes, a real chance of putting the country into disorder, putting the country into ethnic conflicts, like the breakdown of former Yugoslavia, right? Or currently, you know, I can uh, cite the example of Haiti, or Rwanda, or Burundi, yes? Or, you know, former Soviet republics, yes? If you get this ethnic and national conflicts, it's like you open the Pandora box, right? If you value, right? I, I'm not the one who is supposed to evaluate, you know, this relative importance of different goals, right? One theory says that uh, basically, the reason why uh, this democratization produces bad results is because uh, people at low level of income, they value their democratic rights uh, not so highly, right? Uh, for instance, the question, how uh, much uh, 
uh, of your income you will give up in order to enjoy the privilege of the democratic rights, right? If you have one dollar a day, right, you wouldn't give a lot of your income because then you are dead, right? You don't have a lot of food, right? If you have $50,000 a year, right, well then you probably will give up some money uh, in order to enjoy this democratic right. So this value of democracy changes, right? So when the value of democracy is very low for the majority of people because people are very poor, they're willing to sell this right. Sell not through explicit contract, but sell through you know, some kind of implicit contracts. For instance, uh, lobbying, yes, because the uh, financial tycoons capture the media, right? Uh, and influence the government, right, they can actually mobilize the votes in their favor, right? So this is one of the channels how democratization may influence the capture of the state. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that there is a trade-off. It appears that there is a trade-off. How you deal with this trade-off depends on the relative uh, weight that you put on democracy in your utility function, right, in your welfare, in your welfare function, right? There are Goals like dem democracy, participation in decision making, goals like uh, uh, safe environment, goals like GDP per capita, go goals like everything else, right? So uh, I'm trying to avoid this question which will drive us into you know, highly philosophical debates. So, uh, I think Sergei Davidov there has, has a question. If um, you're I'm not an economist, and that's one of your views, uh, but I'm surprised. Why do you put you know, democratization as the uh, antinomy of law and order. For me, those, they are synonymous. For me, law and order is the aim of every democratization. Right. They're of a piece. Yeah. And in your argument and everything, you always put them as an antinomy. Yeah, right. It's, it's the frequent argument that is being given, right? They say, you cannot have law and order without uh, democratization. Why? Because democratization eliminates corruption, right? You can vote out corrupted officials of, of the office. Well, we look at the evidence and we don't see it, right? We look at the evidence, we can name countries with a high law and order, like Hong Kong. And we can name a lot of countries which have democracy, right? And that do, that do not have any law and order, right? Like Haiti, right? Haiti, you would say, Haiti is not a democracy, right? right? There is a tendency to call, you know, this democracy, democracy cannot be a bad thing, right? That's why, you know, all the bad things are not called democracies, right? However, for the research purposes, you need to separate, yes? Uh, let's say not democracy, but elections, right? Just elections, right? Let's say elections. So this elections and, say, political parties and freedom of press, right? Uh, uh, what is the impact of these elections? Elections is also a good thing, right? You cannot have, you, you really have a democracy without elections. So these elections, when you introduce these elections at a low stage of development with a poor law and order, then you get pretty bad results. This is what uh, I was trying to say. They make a distinction between, uh, say, a liberal and the liberal democracies. Sometimes they call uh, these democracies also consolidated, non-consolidated. Sometimes they have even the expression electoral democracies. You have the votes, but nothing else. The voting, but nothing else, which means you don't have the law and order. It's the other way of saying it. It's the other way of putting it, right? Introduction of the voting procedures in countries which are not really prepared for that may be associated with costs, right? And these countries are countries with poor law and order. That's the only argument. I guess there are. Well, should I manage the questions? Yeah. Sorry. So, we'll please um, go ahead. You say, especially in the conclusion, that law and order kind of under, without law and order, the ability of a new democracy to manage economic growth is undermined. But there's a growing body of literature, especially now considering China, which you mentioned, that kind of separates the degree of law and order between the economic realm and the political realm, specifically. You can have kind of an institutionalized economic realm with, while simultaneously denying any kind of, you know, well, or any kind of institutionalized political realm. I think um, Mosquito and Downs talk about coordination goods. So you can kind of deny law and order and maintain the arbitrariness in the political realm while regular making the, the economic realm more institutional. Does that change? the impact that democratization would have on a system like China, in which the economic um, realm of government is pretty, is pretty institutionalized, but the political realm is still arbitrary. 
Yes, that's exactly the distinction I was trying to make, and I was just calling it differently, right? You talk about political rights, right? And, say, law and order in the realm of economic rights, right? Contract rights, property rights. Well, I would add to this even more, right? The right to be free from ethnic and uh, religious and, you know, racial and gender and all kinds of other discriminations, right? How do I know that in this respect China today is a more orderly country, yes, that there is more law and order in, in China than in Russia. Because in China, several years ago, there was a court process that set the example, yes. The court decided on a complaint by the employee that was not hired by a bank because the employee was, as they say, vertically challenged, right? He was, not, he was not high enough. And the banks were willing to have, you know, nice guys who are tall, you know, and handsome and so on, right? He went to the court, he won the case. In Russia, if this process will happen in another 10 years, yes, I would be very impressed, right? In Russia, they are not even talking about it, right? This is law and order, yes? This is actually human rights, right? How do I know that in China there are more human rights than in Russia? Because in China, when they construct something, and they construct 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? They come to you and say, we're sorry for inconvenience, that we're making noise, yes? And they're always making noise because it's, you know, it's uh, you know, with the projectors all night, right? But here is, you know, 300 yuan, very small sum of money. Yuan is 8.3 to one dollar, so by basically several dozen, several dozen of dollars. Sorry for the inconvenience. This is what we pay you to compensate you for the inconvenience that we create. In Russia, you don't do these kind of things. How do I know there is more law and order in China? Because uh, the mortality rate, uh, not mortality, excuse me, the murder rate in China is uh, two people per 100,000 inhabitants, or inhabitants, right? Actually, in the United States, it's six to seven, right? Six to seven, so the probability of being killed in the United States is greater than the probability of being killed in China. But in Russia, it's 30, right? 30 people per 100,000 of inhabitants. Only Colombia has a greater murder rate than Russia. Brazil, Mexico, Argentina uh, have lower murder rates, 17, 20, something like that. Russia currently went down from 30 to 25, to be more objective, yes, to Putin. There was some decrease in the murder rate under Putin. So this is exactly what I mean, and I think you mean, by saying, you call it economic rights, well, let's expand it. Let's say it's all the rights except political rights. The Freedom House distinguishes between two kinds of rights, political rights and civil liberties. This is what we call civil liberties, right? You can have the right for fair trial in the court, like in Hong Kong, right? You can have the right for, uh, you know, uh, uh, your property and your life being protected, which is, you know, what really matters for uh, economic development and for investors, right? If you look at foreign direct investment, for instance, of course they go not, they're not related, they're not correlated at all with the democracy level and the increase in democratization. They are correlated with the rule of law, right? So uh, the argument here would be that uh, this political rights, yes, is the only group of rights that is not delivered, right, by uh, the uh, authoritarian regimes, right? Even though all the other rights are basically protected, yes, in quite a number of authoritarian regimes. So once uh, political rights are not delivered, you can have pretty strong economic growth. When you deliver these political rights under the low law and order, you have a mess, right? That's basically the argument. Just to so, follow up on that point, by the way, yeah. um, you know, there was an article in the front page of the New York Times a few months ago, uh, which started off with a proposition that out of the 965,785 people charged with crime in China, 900, and, you know, the, the same number were found guilty. Yeah. Uh, because if you get charged with crime in China, there is... Uh, well, the presumption of innocence simply does not exist. How do you reconcile that statistic with what you've just uh, uh, presented? Well, actually, uh, you know, in China, uh, the major opposition to the regime is on the left, right? And I happened to read uh, the, uh, say, Jimin Jabao site, yes, and uh, what people put on the Jimin Jabao site. Today, the demonstrations, which are not organized by the government, right, are taking place with the portraits of Mao, right? Under the slogan of social justice, under the slogan of, you know, restoration of communist ideals, right? Today, people in China are generally not happy 
uh, uh, that the government is not putting to jail a lot of the government officials. Yes, the public opinion in China unequivocally. Yes, if there are you know Chinese students in the room, they can probably support you know what I'm saying. Right? There, there is no question about it. Yes, most Chinese are persuaded that the government is not doing the job in fighting the corrupt officials and in putting them to jail. Right? China shoots every year 1,000 to 2,000 people, according to Amnesty International. China doesn't publish the statistics more than any other country in the world. Uh, but there are some. Um, there was recently a case when, uh, what's his name? I forgot. Uh, the head of the, uh, in Guangzhou, I think, there was a head of the Bank of China branch who ran to the United States with about $200 million. He was recently given back to China on the condition that he's not going to get uh, a sentence which is more than 12 years. Chinese government negotiated it with the United States. Now, according to Chinese law, he would be shot right, right away. Most people that are shot uh, in China are murderers and rapists and also those who are engaged in the, in the fraud. Yes, nobody is shot for political reasons. Yes, there are just a small number of people that are being put to jail because of political reasons. There is a reform of the judicial process and actually, I'm not familiar with the statistics that most people that are uh, brought to the, uh, that are being accused, are being sentenced, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, you may be right, uh, this I don't know, but uh, you know, my perception is that in China, the major discontent is with uh, the government not enforcing laws strictly enough. The demonstrations that take place, unorganized demonstrations, they are with a portrait of Mao on another reason, not because it is social justice and uh, you know, restoration of the previous ideals, uh, but also because the police still has uh, a lot of uh, respect to Mao Zedong, and uh, they are afraid that you know, they don't beat people which uh, carry the portrait of Mao, right? Because portrait of Mao may fall on the floor, yes, and everything can happen. Well, anyway, this is what I can say. There is quite a number of questions. Should I manage it? I think you were the first one. So. If regime time doesn't matter for the rule of law, what matters for the rule of law? Uh, that's a good question. And uh, uh, let me tell you the story from the, uh, 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 the part of the world that I am most familiar with, which is post-communist countries. Uh, how you can undermine the rule of law, right? Uh, generally, uh, if you reduce the share of the government spending, uh, this is government revenue, so it's net of the government budget deficit. If you reduce the share of government spending in GDP considerably, then you may expect that you won't have enough resources to enforce uh, the rules and regulations. Uh, so uh, the story in the post-communist countries was associated with very rapid reduction. This is the dismantling of the state, right? In Central European countries, this uh, uh, share of government revenues in GDP was pretty much the same, right? It, it decreased in all the countries, but not much. However, in all the other regions, it decreased dramatically. You would say it decreased in China. Uh, this is the line for China. Uh, it did decrease in China, but once you go to the next chart, you see, uh, I was using this chart in the uh, in the class today in the morning, you would see that the expenditure for the ordinary government in China stayed roughly at the same level. And currently there is even the increase of the total government spending to about 20%. Since 1994 they increased uh, uh, until 2004 to about 20%. But the expenditure for the ordinary government, which is the expenditure for education, healthcare, law and order, infrastructure, so it's not associated, these items above, are the items which are not associated with the institutional capacity of the state. Debt service, defense, subsidies, and investment, right? So unfortunately, more detailed statistics is not comparable by countries, right? But at least we can do that much. This concept of the ordinary government is the one that was put forward by Barry Norton, right? A scholar uh, which does um, studies on uh, Chinese economy. So in China, the share of the expenditure for the ordinary government remained intact. And the GDP in China from 78 to 94 increased, well, probably, you know, four times or whatever it was, yes? So the government spending increased together with GDP, right? So probably also increased in physical units, yes, in constant yuans. It increased probably also four times, right? So the Chinese state capacity was, uh, was there, yes? And as I usually say, the Chinese government 
has one thing in common with the Central European governments. It catches mice, right? It catches mice, it delivers, right? It fights for crime, it provides education, it provides healthcare services, right? In East European countries, the murder rate is two people per 100,000 of inhabitants. In China, it's also two people per 100,000 of inhabitants. It's growing. During the reforms, it increased dramatically. Before the reforms, it was much lower. Um, before the reforms, police in China had very low prestige. To marry a policeman was a bad deal, yes? To marry an army guy was a good deal. Why? Because police didn't have much things to do. Uh, the person who was getting the money at the end of the day from the shop was taking the money to the bank on a bike, right, on a public transport, right? Now this is not the case. Now in China you have, you know, three people in bulletproof jackets with the machine guns that they hold just like that, right, when the money are being taken from the bank. Well, it tells you that the state capacity is there. Yes, the crime rate increases, but the state capacity is still there. What happened in Russia was a collapse of the state. Not only the GDP went down, right, but also the share of government spending in GDP for ordinary government went down dramatically. And the example I usually give, and I think I gave this example uh, in the class today, imagine you have, uh, uh, say, three policemen, and now instead of three policemen, you have only one policeman. Or you have three policemen, but you pay this three policemen three times less, right? So you know what happens when you underpay the police. Yes, the police have the ways to compensate uh, for the lost income, right? So this is virtual. Uh, virtual collapse of the state. This is a very non uh, uh, ideological argument. This is not the argument that you know the state should be bigger or the state should be smaller. Yes, there is a whole lot of debate what is the optimal size of the state and so on. If in five years you have the reduction of the share of government spending in GDP from say 50% to about 30%, right, then it's the collapse of the government, right, because uh, the government cannot uh, work with the amount of money that it, it, it has. Yes, as they say, say, don't shoot into the pianist. The pianist plays as good as he can. So the government does the job that it can do. With less money, it cannot deliver. It can, you, it's unreasonable to expect that the efficiency of the provision of the government services would increase dramatically. Here you can see that there is a relationship between the average share of government, government revenues in GDP in 93-96 and the increase in the share of the shadow economy. Right? Or if you put here not the increase in the share of the shadow economy, but the absolute uh, level of the shadow economy, the relationship would be the same. If the government was uh, retreating, right, so here the share of government spending, this is Central European countries, right, and in countries like Georgia, uh, the share of government spending in GDP is 15%. So there the shadow economy, as the government was retreating, the shadow economy was jumping in, right. This is a different kind of relationship that you have in the United States. You have higher taxes, larger shadow economy, right. The U.S. will have say, lower shadow economy than Scandinavian countries where you have higher taxes and higher tax revenues as a proportion of GDP. In transition economies, it doesn't work this way. So maybe to show you the other. So part of the story is that collapse of government expenditure and revenues, which is sort of a policy variable. Sometimes it was possible to control it, sometimes not. But this collapse of the government revenues, decrease in the share of government revenues in GDP, was associated with poor economic performance. This is 96 GDP as compared to 98. GDP, uh, 1989 GDP, which is the initial year of transition. You can see that countries where the decrease was by 30 percentage points, right? It means it was 40 percent and now it went down to say 10 percent, right? In a minute. So here the performance was very poor. There is obvious, when you introduce it into regressions, it works. This is the indicator that explains a lot of uh, performance. Well, I guess uh, there were two questions uh, here. Well, uh, maybe were, were you the ones? Uh, so you, sh you should excuse me if I do it in the wrong order. Yes. So would you like to? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, one of the arguments you actually tested from slightly here, and uh, I read it in one of your uh, essays, and that's the privatization of democratic procedure in countries and new democracies with a low level of law and order. If if one were to have a rather cynical look at full-fledged democracies and major democracies. There is an element of privatization in that procedure too. So is it something inherent to the democratic system, privatization of the procedure? Well, you know, the theoretical argument would be that uh, if people really value democratic rights, yes, if their incomes are high, right, and there, if there is an established law and order system, these are two mechanisms that prevent the misuse of democracy, right? Why? Because first, uh, 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 you know, if there is a law and order procedure, right, uh, then it's pretty difficult to make the 
uh, officials corrupted, right? To make the officials corrupted means to steal the state, to privatize the state, right? Uh, and uh, secondly, if there is, uh, if people treasure this, you know, democratic values, then they would be prepared to, you know, sacrifice part of their income to devote, you know, their time to make sure that democracy really works, to use their vote, yes? If they don't value it, they just, you know, give it away, yes? They give it away to someone. In, uh, you know, in, uh, say, uh, United States in the 19th century, there was a, you know, system of uh, uh, rigging uh, the elections, there was, you know, the same vote, uh, the same ballot uh, that was used many times, you know, it was literate, literate selling of the votes, right? But then the, the uh, ways became more sophisticated. So I, I wouldn't say there is something wrong with democracy if they have the rule of law. The argument was that if uh, there is a rule of law and there is um, uh, a certain level of development where people treasure this right, yes, then democracy works perfectly well, yes. You get the result actually that uh, is consistent with something that uh, Sergei Davidov suggested that the improvement uh, uh, in uh, democratic uh, rights uh, makes your bureaucracy cleaner, right? You get this result. So your growth rate actually accelerates if your rule of law is high. Democratization helps you to increase the growth rate, probably because your bureaucracy gets cleaner, right? But once your rule of law is low, you get all kinds of unpredicted results. Uh, so maybe I take your question and then there were questions. I'm sorry if I was not taking. Yes. Yeah. But, uh, throughout such a large uh, time frame, how can you take into account that uh, the, the, the data taken at that time was as accurate as the data taken now? Yes, the, uh, uh, the mortality rate is one of the most reliable statistics, right? And I know why there may be uh, an, uh, an understatement of mortality rate, right? This understatement takes place because of infant mortality. Infant mortality. Uh, uh, see, uh, the, in the Soviet Union and even today in Russia, right? Uh, if a baby is born and live less than five years, uh, five, five days, right? And if a baby is less than, you know, 1.5 kilos or something, I don't remember the exact numbers, then it is not registered as a birth, right? If it is not registered as a birth and the baby dies in five days, so there is no birth, there is no death, right? So uh, your indicator of total mortality actually is being decreased, it's understated. There are norms of the World Health Organization. What is the weight of a baby? What is the, um, uh, the number of days that the baby is supposed to live? I forgot what is the standard, but Russia, uh, even now, is not consistent with the standard. So there was an understatement here, and there is an understatement here, right? But this understatement is not very considerable because it's only children's mortality. Children's mortality are normally higher than the mortality in Middle Ages, right? Uh, however, it's a small portion of total mortality, right? So maybe this rate is actually not 10, but you know, 12%. But this rate then is not 16, but then 18%, right? So maybe that's the magnitude of the, of the overstatement, right? So these statistics you basically can't trust, right? Uh, what you cannot trust is this indices. I don't like this indices. I forgot to say this political right index of the Freedom House and civil liberties index, right, are very correlated. And uh, you cannot really, civil liberties index does not measure civil liberties, it also measures democracy. Because in this respect, Freedom House is very much political oriented. The assumption is that if you don't have democracy, you cannot have civil rights. And we're trying to separate these two things. So we use the other indices, which is the index of investment climate, which is based on the International Country Risk Guide, which is available for 1980s. The Corruption Perception Index, right, of Transparency International, which also makes a lot of sense. Uh, and also the shadow economy. Shadow economy is also the objective indicator. Unfortunately, the murder rates for these countries, uh, which is a good measure of institutional capacity, are not available for all the years. So I, I was not, we were not able to find this comparable statistics for all the years. Uh, now, I think there was a question uh, here. Sorry if I... Uh, yes, please go ahead. And then your question. Okay. Fair trial, for example, without freedom of speech or freedom 
Yeah, I would say, well, let us talk about voting, yes, which is, uh, you know, For Democratic rights, you mean only voting? Uh, basically, I mean, the, the index that I use includes several things. It includes freedom of press. It includes freedom to create political parties, uh, freedom to the manifestations, I guess, and also freedom to vote and to be elected, right? This is political rights index by definition of the Freedom House, right? So that's why, you know, I... Uh, uh, we can look at voting, yes, and whether voting is, you know, fair or not fair. But, uh, you know, to make a long story a short one, uh, it, you would agree that there could be an authoritarian regime guaranteeing the freedom of press, right? Think about Europe in the beginning of the 20th century. Was there freedom of press? Well, yes, but even in Britain, the share of people that voted was something like 20, 30 percent at that time, right? Uh, because all women were excluded, right? And then, you know, half of men because of different, different requirements, right? Uh, uh, what was uh, the first country in Europe where women got the right to vote? Uh, the answer is the first country was Finland, and they got the right to vote in 1905 or 1906 uh, from the not very democratic Tsarist regime in Russia, because Finland at that time was a great duchy on Finland, but a colony of Russia, basically, right? So authoritarian Tsarist regime, which was by far not the most democratic, right, in Europe, uh, granted this right to vote. Uh, do we know the, uh, you know, free, uh, free trial, the right to the free trial? Well, uh, you know, in uh, Vera Zasurich, to give you the example, who uh, shot the interior minister of Russia in uh, 1970 something, right? Oh, excuse me, 1870, 1870 something, yes? Uh, she was a Narodnik, right? And she shot the interior minister because the interior minister gave the order to punish a student with the uh, Cain punishment, right? Uh, she just came and shot him. But because of the reform of the judiciary that it was introduced by the Tsar, at that time it was Alexander II, and that created the jury, the jury unanimously decided that uh, the Vera Zasulich was not, not guilty. And she was acquitted, right? Under very undemocratic Tsarist regime, right? Where there was no voting at all. It was not a constitutional democracy, uh, the constitutional monarchy, it was absolute monarchy, right? So under the absolute monarchy, basically you had relatively free press at that time, and uh, you had the judicial process which was such that led to uh, uh, the acquittance of uh, uh, people that were killing interior ministers, right? Uh, so basically that's the answer to the question, right? So I, uh, I think that's it. So let me, uh, y yes, your question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I understood you properly. You are saying that... Uh, I, I'm, saying, I'm wondering if you consider the fact that with um, changes in the regime, there were structural changes in the economy that could have affected economic performance. Well, yeah, I think... Uh, so you are saying that economic performance could have deteriorated uh, because of the factors which are not associated with democratization, yeah. right? Uh, absolutely, yes. This is a, a valid argument, and uh, if I can show, you know, I did a number of papers of why economic performance differs. And if you wait for the moment, I would be able to show you the chart uh, that is uh, uh, basically maybe here. No. This one. Basically, the story of performance in transition economies is here. Uh, it is affected by something that I call distortions, and distortions uh, is uh, the uh, differences in the structure of the economy between the centrally planned economy at the last year of its existence and between the, the market economies of the same level of development. 
For instance, all the industrialization and underdevelopment of the service sector, right? If you compare, say, Czech Republic with countries like, uh, I forgot what was the basis for comparison for the Czech Republic, uh, but probably countries like, you know, Greece, for instance, right? Uh, and uh, relatively the same size of GDP per capita and relatively the same, uh, the same size of the country, total GDP, then you get the result that, you know, Czech Republic was over-industrialized, right? You take into account all these distortions, the assumption is that once market prices are allowed to be in charge of the reallocation of resources, the allocation will change. Previously, the allocation was carried out by the planners, right? And they did it in a... Uh, uh, their own way. They had particular perceptions, right? There is a story why they did it in this way and not the other way, but uh, uh, they did it, you know, some, some, somehow, and this was very different from the market prices. So you compare the distribution of resources in the market economy with the allocation of resources in a centrally planned economy, right? And you get the result that in some countries distortions were high, some countries distortions were low. And uh, uh, one of my articles actually is devoted to that. It develops this index of distortions, uh, and it turns out that it has a lot of predictory, uh, a lot of explanatory power for the subsequent performance, right? But this is not the end of the story. Why? Because there are two stylized facts that do not fit into the scheme. It explains about 60% of the variations in performance of transition economies, right? Uh, 30 transition economies, including China and Vietnam, East European countries, former Soviet Union. But if you make predictions, yes, if you can compute using the regression equations, you compute, you do the extrapolation, right? It turns out that China overperformed, actual performance of China was better than predicted, actual performance of Central Europe better than predicted, actual performance of the former Soviet Union worse than predicted. What was the factor that was uh, missing, that was uh, present uh, in China and in Central Europe, and that was missing in the former Soviet Union? Institutional capacity of the state. And this institutional capacity of the state is associated with democratization. So basically, the argument that I was uh, making, uh, I think I skipped it, but let me come uh, back to uh, this um, uh, chart. It is here, uh, and uh, I'll get to this chart in a moment. It will require some time because the mouse here is, uh, is too small for my big fingers. <laughs> So we go to F5, and we can look at uh, uh, we can look at this chart, right? Uh, so remember, we discussed this chart, right? And uh, what we haven't discussed is uh, the impact of the rule of law and democratization on performance. This is performance, uh, 1996 or 1998 GDP. That's why there are two. Uh, points, one green, one uh, red, uh, as compared to the GDP in 1989. And it looks like there is a relationship, basically positive, between the ratio of rule of law to democracy and uh, the change in GDP per capita. The higher is the ratio, the better is the change of GDP per capita. This line is for authoritarian regimes like Vietnam, China, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, uh, Tajikistan is... Uh, uh, not authoritarian regime at that time, uh, uh, but it had the civil war. Uh, and this is basically all the other countries, right? Now, it could be that it is only because of the rule of law, not because of the democracy, because democracy is in the denominator, rule of law is in the numerator, right? So the high is the rule of law, the better is performance, but the high is democratization, uh, the high is the indicator, so it should uh, affect uh, this. The, it's not democratization, it's even the level of democracy. However, when we put it into uh, regressions, and here I need to resort to another uh, chart, and uh, it will take, I'll just show you these regressions because basically they exist. Uh, they are here. Here is, let's see if I have a better one. Okay, this is the only regression I have here. Here we have the democracy index with a minus sign and the rule of law index with a minus, with a plus sign. 
And when you include them both, actually it turns out that uh, uh, not only the rule of law contributed to better performance, but democratization contributed to worse performance. Now, uh, the story that goes together with it is that democratization in the presence of the weak rule of law undermined institutions. And then uh, something that I said previously basically applies, right? That democratization limited the capacity of the state to collect taxes, limited the capacity of the state to deliver public goods. So this is associated with the democratization under the poor rule of law. For transition economies, there's a pretty strong evidence. And for all the countries, there is a pretty strong evidence, although in some cases, yes, I think I forgot to mention it, but when I go to exact channels, right, not everything can be proved, right? Sometimes there are two competing hypotheses. Sometimes you can get, for instance, the explanation for the change in corruption index, right? without democratization at all. You get better results if you don't include democratization at all, but you use other variables, right? So there, in some cases, there are competing hypotheses, so this is not completely, completely done already. Uh, now, I think the, this, uh, this uh, Paul, Paul Wanakot has the last question. Uh, I think it is time for us to wrap up. Uh, I believe no one will accuse Professor Popov for not being thorough. Um, and uh, I trust you'll join me in thanking him very much.